It is time. We are studying this week Daniel 6, and we're going to take the first 11 verses tonight. So you've got your outline, I believe. Now, as I was studying this, there are a couple things that struck me very much. The first was that I was going to try to cover more in this chapter than just the first 11 verses. And the more I studied it, the more I realized that there's a, a material in it and a concept in it that's so important, and I think especially for us today, that it really demands our attention and it demands us to study it in a more in-depth way. And so that's what I'm trying to do tonight by only taking 11 verses. Now, you know, as we move through chapter 6, we get into then the last six uh, chapters of Daniel, which, of course, are all prophetic. And they're, because they're prophetic, they're rather exciting. Certainly when we get to chapter 9, it's probably the most single, most dramatic, mathematical prediction in the entire Bible. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, you almost want to run to the last six or seven chapters to get to that. And yet, I really was felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me that, that the information that we have here and its application to our lives is extremely important. So let's read the first three verses and go over some of the things that are involved here. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they should be in charge of the whole kingdom, and over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one that these satraps might be accountable to them, that is the three commissioners, and the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. And don't underline that, if you would, and keep it in mind, because it's going to explain to you the story of what happens in the rest of the chapter. Okay? The, the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Well, let's go through a couple things here first. First of all, there's this question that we need to try to answer. And as it starts out talking about, it seemed good to Darius. Who's Darius? We know that Cyrus is the king of the Medea Persians. Who's Darius? His son. Well, let me, let's go through. Well, isn't Darius the terminology, like president or? No, it's, it's, it's reference to a specific person. All right. It's something it is. The same guy? Now, let's talk about who it can't be. Okay? It cannot refer to the king Darius I who was a successor to Cyrus, and he reigned from 522 to 486 B.C. We know about him in the lineage of the Medea Persian kings. So it cannot be him. Wrong time frame. Okay? <clears throat> now, it's, I do not think, personally, that it was another name for King Cyrus. Some people think Darius was Cyrus. I think that that's not true, again, I'm giving you my opinion from studying it. You can come up with a different opinion from your own study. But I think it's extremely unlikely that Cyrus, who was holding together the Medea and the Persian Empire, purposely marrying a woman who was a Mede, okay? And most of his army at this point, we know from historical references, were still highly populated by the Medeans. So he's in kind of a tenuous position politically trying to hold together this kingdom that really hasn't bonded well together. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
right? I think it's unlikely that he's going to try to rule that kingdom from Babylon because that's not the center of the government. The center of the government is up in Iran. That's where he is, okay? Afghanistan in that area. So, you know, this is all, Babylon's almost an outpost to the southwest. It's a good 600 miles or more away from where he is. So I think, personally, I think it's unlikely that, that it's a reference to Cyrus. Now, there's a very famous person that we know was involved in the capture of Babylon. His name is Gubaru. He is mentioned in many, many historical documents. Herodotus talks about him. He was Cyrus's number one favorite general. And it looks like he was the one that was in charge of engineering the takeover of Babylon. Remember, they built, they built a canal, dug out a, a, a lake, diverted the Euphrates River into it, lowered the water level. It was a big project. Gubaru was the, was the general who was in charge of all of this. So I think, I think it is most likely another term for Gubaru. Okay, the name's Darius. Does that name have another spelling? Gubaru? Mm -hmm. Maybe. In the last lesson, you talked about one of the Babylonian generals that defected to the Medo-Persians, and his was G-O-B-R-Y-U-S. Is that a different person? No, I think it may be the same person. Okay. Because he had a relative that was killed. who was killed and betrayed by Belshazzar, by Belshazzar and, and he ended up coming over. I think it's probably the same person. See, the, the, when you start to get into, her, into historical documents, you read Herodias, okay. you read Philo, you read all, they don't always spell the same person the same way. Okay? So you have to kind of look at it and say, okay, who are they talking about? You know, so I, I think it's just an alternate spelling for this person. So that, that was my question. Yeah. Now, Don't it, they also have the same problem of interpretation besides just the spelling of the name when you go back and look at how the Bible was originally put together in its books? Interpretation in what sense? Translation. Well, that's true. There, 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 there always is the issue of translation in terms of what, you know, how, and we're going to look at some, some examples of this tonight again. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you take an Aramaic word and translate it in, in its best case to English? You can't do it word for word because, again, it's, it, it involves concepts. There isn't a one-for-one -one translation often. Just like you always look at the original. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I go back to the original, and I, and I did that here, too. Now, one thing we do know about Gubru, because of the writings of Herodias, is that he did rule as a select governor uh, in Babylon from 539 to 525 B.C. Several historical documents uh, evidence this. So I think he's our best case for being called Darius here. And again... It's amazing how many different, especially in the Babylonian and Persian world, how many different names the same person had. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was almost like, well, this is his official name, here's his political name, here's his birth name, and here's his <laughs> nickname. Okay, I mean, yeah. you know, and so sometimes they'll use them interchangeably, and you're kind of going the whole. Yeah. Which, which, you know. And this is how his wife calls him. Exactly. I mean, it, and we do the same thing to an extent. You know, we call the same person multiple names. But when you, you're in the hood. <laughs> <laughs> also, it depends sometimes on your behavior when you get called, too. But, yeah, that's true. All right. All right. Now, who are satraps? Well, they were local governors over a province area. Uh, I can show you a couple examples of this, but... The meaning of the word satrap in Aramaic is protector of the realm, okay? So 
they were often of royal heritage, though not always, but, but frequently they were some relative uh, of, of royalty somehow. And they had a staff with them, always. It always included an official scribe who was one that wrote down laws, you know, wrote down codes, made them official, sent communiques back, you know, uh, to Cyrus, et cetera, et cetera, or to other province areas. They also had a chief taxation officer. Now, there's really an implied reference to him right there, if you notice in the end of verse 2, and it says that the king might not suffer loss. Mm -hmm. That's the loss being talked about here, that no one gets funny with the money, <laughs> okay? And that's what they, these guys were supposed to do. They also had each one in the province a commander of armed forces, a, a local, whether you'd call him colonel, whatever title you'd want to put on him, who was, in, in, who was the chief officer of the armed forces for that province area, okay? Then you also had, from the central government, periodic auditors who would check against issues of graft and theft in office. So the central area of Cyrus in, up in Iran would periodically send these auditors out to say, okay, let's see if anybody's cooking the books. I mean, the, 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 the Medea Persians were very exact in their writings, in their codes, in their rules. I mean, we have tons of examples of how, you know, picky they were, really, almost about all these things. And well, kept, they had a lot of bureaucracy. They did, had tremendous bureaucracy, which, interestingly enough, is what did them in to an extent, too. Now, also, uh, the satraps were also the head of the judicial system for both criminal and civil cases. So they act as a major magistrate in the province area too. So they they wore a couple different hats, uh, each one of these. And in the kingdom of the whole Medea Persian area was broken down into 120 of these. Okay, they weren't all the same size. Some were smaller, some were bigger but they did all have that component of government that I just described in each satrap area. So can we assume that they were very corrupted? Well, not really, you can't gather. They were, there was, let's put it this way, there was a great tendency for them to be corrupted, okay? They tried to do their best because of, of records to not be, but, it was a constant problem. Yeah, knowing human nature. Knowing human nature. They dealt with criminals. Well, they had, they were, and they were dealing with lots of taxation money. Whenever you add power and, the, money. and, and money together, you've got a bad combination. That's so, right. That's right. <laughs> Times haven't changed. Have <laughs> Times have not changed. And that's one of the things. I think this chapter is literally timeless, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to show you why tonight, okay? Now, we must remember, as we look at this whole chapter, that there are certain things about Daniel that are dealt with, because he's the focus of this chapter. And as I note under C here, the chapter proved that he was a man of character, which we're seeing here in verses 1 through 3, that he was a person of consistency, which we'll see in verses 4 through 9, that he was a person of great conviction, and we'll see the evidence of that next week in verses 10 through 15. He was a person of conscience, which will be demonstrated in verses 16 through 22, and of course, a person of great courage, which we'll end up seeing in verse 23. Now, as it says, Daniel was appointed as one of the three commissioners who oversaw all of these satraps. Okay, so he's a higher level than any of the satraps are. He's one of three commissioners. The reason why is because it says that he had distinguished himself. In Aramaic, it's the word nasa, and it means to exhibit or to be preeminent in brightness or brilliance or to, quote, stand out. 
we see a in the New Testament a uh, an example of this. If you want to hold your place in Daniel and turn to uh, Philippians two, we see the same concept communicated here by Paul. Philippians chapter two. verses 14 and 15. 14 starts out, I just have a hard time with this verse. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, that, that one starts me out bad off just to begin with, okay? All right? And then verse 15, that, in other words, the direct cause, if you don't do that, it says that you may prove yourselves to be blameless. That's the concept. Blameless and innocent uh, children of God. The word here, above reproach, would be a very good uh, synonym for what we're talking about here about Daniel. He was a person above reproach. And Paul says we're to be above reproach. And look, look at this. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Now, let me tell you, we are in the midst of this going on, especially in our culture right now. We are in the midst of an exceedingly growing, perverse, and crooked generation. Okay? I just read, I think, today or yesterday, I think it's in Britain, they're now considering outlawing the word mankind because it's a prejudicial word against women and transsexuals. I mean, this is the kind of crap that's going on on a daily basis now, trying to remake the concept of humanity, trying to remake the concept of male and female, trying to remake laws about all these things. In Britain, or I'm sorry, in Canada, it is now a fourth-degree felony to say anything directly against Islam. Fourth-degree felony. It means it's a relatively serious charge, criminal charge against you, where you at the very least will end up paying a sizable penalty monetarily for it, at the least. But it, the, the, I think the uh, code indicates that you could also be jailed for it, too. Okay. This used to be called freedom of speech. This used to be called freedom of religion. This used to be called freedom of expression. It is being outlawed progressively. Okay. The problem is they can speak freely against Of course. Or why people. Of course. But that's why, that's the importance of this verse. As he ends it in Philippians 2, he says among whom you appear as lights in the world. In other words, the darker that the world becomes morally and spiritually, the more light will be shed by those who believe, by those who are Christians, by those who hold firm to their convictions. But like Daniel, don't expect that it's not that it's going to be an easy road, because I assure you, as we looked at what happened to Daniel, it's not going to be an easy road. We're going to see how it wasn't easy for him, and it's probably not going to be easy for us either. Don't you have to think that we go back to what's being taught in the churches today, and the way it goes across the world? Or not taught. Or not taught. Yeah. That leads to the credibility of your statements? Yes, there the, the church, of the, particularly of the what's come to be called the progressive church movement, okay, is what they're calling it, is, has taken out most of the key elements of historical Christianity. It does not talk particularly about the gospel. It does not talk about being reborn, spiritual rebirth. It does not talk about anything but love. It never talks about God's anger. It never talks about God's judgment. It never teaches about prophecy. It never talks about hell. 
It doesn't cover any of those things anymore. Well, those are it doesn't talk about sin. <laughs> exactly. It, it has become a mediocre, lukewarm, people-pleasing, mm -hmm. religious ceremony that people go to on Sundays. You know, tickle the ears, as Paul said, and this is what it is. They really believe that they're doing the right thing, I wonder. Yeah. Well, let's put it this way. They know what they don't want to believe because they won't read it and they won't teach it. It's all there. Mm -hmm. Okay, they don't have a Bible any different than you and I have, mm -hmm. but they sure select an awful lot of things that they don't teach. They don't comprehensively teach, as Paul said, the whole word of God. Mm -hmm. Remember, mm -hmm. he used that phrase teaching the whole word of God. Comprehensive, A to Z. No. So is this a situation where God is letting this thing play out? Very very good question, Norman. And and we when we get down to uh, verses four to eleven, I want to talk about that because I think that's exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And that I want to go there in a minute, okay? But good question. You anticipated it well. well. That's what Romans one said and it gave the moment. Yeah. Okay, now remember, at the end of verse 3, this verse that ends up getting Daniel in big trouble. I just lost my place here. Daniel, here we go. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. He was going to be the preeminent administrator over it all. Okay? Over 120 region yes yeah, now if you want to if you want a target put on your back that would be a very quick way to do it okay and that's exactly what happened and again it's not Daniel who's asking for it it's all an issue of the observation of Darius about Daniel's character that's just what it's all about his character he stands out okay that's what it means, an extraordinary spirit, okay? Uh, it means, uh, it, uh, you see the phrase there? It says yes. uh, the extra, he had an extraordinary spirit. It's the word yetir, and it means excellent, outstanding, superior. And it's interestingly, the same word that's found, turn back a couple pages to Daniel 2, you're going to see exactly the same word used here in verse 31. And this is about this fantastic statue. Remember? Okay, 31. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue, that statue which was large and of extraordinary splendor. That's the word, Yeter. And was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. So you get... You get the idea. From Darius' standpoint, Daniel was a head, arms, and mm -hmm. shoulders above all of them. Mm -hmm. He could find no fault in this man. Right. Okay? And that's why he was being elevated to the position that he was being elevated. Mm -hmm. Now, but could, but could he rule? That's the key question. He did rule. But could he rule? I mean, you got how many different places he's in charge of? Well, like, how, how did he rule? That's well, the part of the question. They, had to be, they had to report to him. They had to be responsible to him. Undoubtedly, he was the one that all these accountings and and everything had to come to, and he had to supervise it all. And we showed her that king was going to <clears throat> On the top of the Three administrators. He was going to be number one of the three. And he was a Jew, not. And that's what we're going to get to also. Yeah, mm -hmm. that 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 it's, created some real. It seems that old Jew in the ground. Yeah, I, I I use my. So, the, we see here that Daniel is a person of integrity, right? That would be the word we'd use in English. It's an interesting word, integrity. It's from the Latin, and it means to be undivided or to be a consistent whole, and of course is used in math to describe a whole number, quote, an integer, right, as opposed to a fraction. That's where we get the word, a whole, undivided. 
So it literally means, by definition, to live by ethical and moral standards without hypocrisy or duplicity. Okay? No duplicity, no, you know. Yes. There's no hidden agenda, no duplicity. That's what integrity would mean. Now, again, in the New Testament, Paul has the same concept. He calls it being above reproach. Okay? So let's look at a couple of those verses about being above reproach. Turn, put your finger or bookmark or wherever you want to there in Daniel to hold yourself there. And let's go to 1 Timothy two, uh, 3 first. And let's look at what Paul says about being above reproach. 1 Timothy 3. Verse 2, he's talking about an overseer, an elder in a local church group. He says, an overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, in other words, excessively argumentative, but gentle, uncontentious, and look at the last one, free from the love of money. So these, these are, uh, these, <laughs> and that's, that's interestingly enough, four chapters later in 1 Timothy, chapter 6, that whole discussion about money being the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the characteristics of being above reproach. Uh, let's t turn over to chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. Again, in verse 7, he says, prescribe these things as well so that they may be above reproach. Now, in this case, he's talking about the obligation that a person has to taking care of their own aged relative. Because you're going to see it in verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially of those of his household, he has denied the faith, it's become worse than unbelievable. In other words, he's saying, have integrity and take care of those people in your household that need to be taken care of. Don't let the elderly parent or whatever it is not have your attention, okay? Do for them as you should do for them. Treat them as you should treat them. Respect them. That's what's being implied here in terms of this concept of being above the drugs back then? Of course they did. Seriously. Oh, yeah. Of course it is. It's called pharmakia, is the Greek word. It included hallucinogens and many other types of substances. So they, they were not chemically <clears throat> manufactured, I mean, manufactured somewhere. No, they were from plant sources. Okay. Yeah. Like that, yeah, because you mentioned Afghanistan. That's the world's population for poppy. Yep. And here, here comes the coke and everything else. Mm -hmm. Opium. Opium. Okay, turn further to the right, past 2 Timothy to Titus, chapter 1. This is again Paul instructing about appointing elders in each church group. And look what he says about them. In verse 5, he says, for this reason I left you in Crete, the island of Crete, that you might be <clears throat> in order, that you might set in order what remains, and I appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, so now he's just described what, how should these people be? What should they be like? If any man be above reproach, here's our word again, a husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation, literally is, a, is an old, kind of an old word for drunkenness, okay, okay, or rebellion, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, as God's steward, okay, not his own steward. And then he says, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, again, starting arguments needlessly, 
not fond of sordid gain, in other words, you know, yeah, doing something to uh, take pilfer from the tills to take for yourself, but rather the elder should be hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, in other words, having good judgment, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, that he may be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. So he has to be a capable student of the Bible. Okay? All of these things are characteristics of this office. Now, this is a high calling. This takes exceptional character. <clears throat> And it's the character that we're that we're looking at here in the person of Daniel. So go back again to Jan Daniel chapter six. Now, um, I want to note something. Also, I'm sorry. Before you go back to Daniel six, since we're already in the New Testament, go to Matthew 23 because I want. I think we need to look at Jesus own comments about those who do not have these characteristics. Remember, the Pharisees were educated, they were sophisticated, they were proud, arrogant, boastful, they always made a show of things, they would have an announcement that they were walking down the street. You know, they wanted to be noted for being teachers and rabbis. They wanted the acclaim of people. You know, this is, I mean, we certainly have lots of documents about the behavior of the Pharisees. But look what Jesus says here in Matthew 23. Because these people, the Pharisees, were leading the Jewish church. They were the leaders of the synagogue. They were supposedly the representatives of God teaching people the way of God. Well, look at what Jesus says about them, starting in verse 1. Weren't they also straddling between Judaism and Romanism? To some extent. They, they had their political intrigues, their political ties, and they also were fabulously known for this thing that we've talked about before, about Corban how you steal someone's inheritance from them, okay, and call it God's will. And they did this all the time to accumulate more wealth. So it hasn't, hasn't changed. So let's look at what Jesus says, starting verse 1 of Matthew 23. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. In other words, they're declaring that they somehow are competent and knowledgeable of the Torah. They know its codes, they know how to teach it, etc. Okay? The chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, <laughs> in other words, when they teach the words in the Torah, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. They violate the very things they are teaching in the synagogue on Sabbath. And they tie up heavy loads and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as their finger. In other words, they'll burden everyone else down, but they'll take the easy way out. But they do all these deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries. Do you know what phylacteries were? Okay. Phylacteries were either a leather pouch or a wooden box with straps on it, and the Pharisees and the rabbis would take little uh, parts of Scripture, let, let's say a verse from Isaiah or from Proverbs, and they would take this little piece of papyrus and put it in this little pouch or box, and they would tie it to their head because they were literalizing where it says that you're supposed to keep the Word of God in your heart and your mind constantly. Okay, well, they literally tied it on their foreheads, okay, as a show of how incredibly spiritual they were, okay? 
became their ornament. That's what a phylactery was. Okay. So where they do? Uh, so they do. Yeah. And also they lengthen the tassels of their garments, mm -hmm. and they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues. In other words, they want to be in the first row, mm -hmm. right up there, you know, so everyone can see how important and prominent they are. And respectful greetings in the marketplaces. They want people to kind of honor them about, oh, Rabbi so-and-so is walking by. Isn't he wonderful, you know? And respectful greetings in the marketplaces, being called by men rabbi, teacher it means, literally, okay? Rabboni. But they, but, but do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Now let's drop down there. He's going on, but let's drop down to 20, uh, verses 27 and 28 because it, it's kind of a summary of what he's saying about the Pharisees, okay? So drop down to 27, same chapter, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. Now, there's quite a complimentary, <laughs> you know, analogy, you know. He said, you're like a grave where it's nicely inscribed on the outside and kept nice and polished, but inside it's full of death. Mm -hmm. and, and then verse 20, even so, you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And then he goes on and denounces the whole chapter, literally. He spends denouncing the behavior and the lack of character of the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes. Mm -hmm. This is the opposite of Daniel, okay? Daniel is the complete opposite of what Jesus is mentioning here. Now, let's read uh, verses 4 through 11 of Daniel 6. Here's the plot. Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel <clears throat> in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Kind of like today. I mean, you think about those verses and you try to think, is there any elected official we know that could be lived by this standard? No, no. I mean, there's probably not a one. Uh -uh. Everybody's got their agenda. Everybody's got their pocket lined by somebody else. I mean, let's face it. If you get elected to Congress, you walk out of that place a millionaire. Mm -hmm. Do you know anyone that's not a millionaire in Congress? Yeah, right. Okay. I mean, Why? How could you end up being elected as a government official and all of a sudden go from be, having a nominal income to walking out of that place a few years later and with millions? Because the ones, the ones that you asked, yeah. as an Ohio senator, I hate to say it, but it's Sherrod Brown. Of course. Yeah. He, he has not really got a dime or a dollar to his name, really. But if you look at Jim Renacy, who ran against him, he's one of the owners, the principal owners of more nursing homes all over the world, yeah. and he's got millions of, of course. dollars. Well, and of course, most politicians have millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. If you look at the history of Barbara Boxer out in California, oh, okay, how about how about our dear Nancy Pelosi? That woman is millionaire times many, and then her colleague, uh, what's her name? Uh, Waters. Waters. No, not Waters. Elizabeth. Yeah. The other, the other colleague out in, in California, uh, the one that was Barbara, no, not Boxer, um, the one that was behind the Kavanaugh assassination, where she put up the, yes, Diane Feinstein. You ever looked at her? My goodness, this woman has sold her soul to the Chinese and has made, they think, she may be close to being a billionaire, she and her husband together. Mm -hmm. They have been in the real estate market selling everything the Chinese are willing to buy out in California. I mean, she's up to the eyeballs in money, mm -hmm. you know. These people 
cannot possibly have a serious interest in what's best for this country. Right. Have you read anything about waters? No, of course. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, Maxine should just check herself into a mental institution to <laughs> get some help because right. she's, she's going to do with her uh, limo driver in that Rolls Royce she rides now. Oh. And, of course, the, the money she gets for her daughter and the corruption, oh, it's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the point, why are we sitting yeah, why are we going to Washington? Okay. You know. But the point, I'm sorry, the point I'm trying to make is we look at the natural progression of the politician, okay, and we see the corruption, we see the power, we see the influence, okay, we see that being sent to Washington is a surefire way to end up with skeletons and more closets than you can count. That's what happens. And we compare this to what's being said about the nature of Daniel and what should be our nature, okay? Daniel is an example of who we need to become also, okay? He's God's man. So we go on. I, th I think I uh, – what I end up um, – yeah, no, I was, I read verse 4. I read verse 4, so let's, let's read 5 through 9. So they can't find anything about how he's done a single thing wrong administrating the province in any respect, okay? Then these men said, we shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Then these commissioners and the satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to them as follows. King Darius lived forever, and all the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors, have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, for 30 days, shall be cast in the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is, the injunction. So let's take this apart. Now, the spiritual lesson of this entire chapter is how we too, like Daniel, are called to thrive and excel in a hostile world where the key element to our success is integrity and an unwillingness to compromise, compromise our faith, in other words. That itself, in the world that we live in, will create tension, Jealousy, discrimination, ridicule, ac and accusations where they would call us bigoted and intolerant, and it will inevitably at some point lead to a crisis that will be for our testing. That's what happened to Daniel, and that's what's going to also, I believe, happen to us. Now, Let's look at a couple of verses here in the New Testament. And the last one I think is extremely important, which I'll tell you about. I didn't write it down. But look at Ephesians 6.16. Again, put your keep your place in Daniel, but go to the New Testament. Back to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Here's what Paul says about testing, okay? A testing that's, of course, directed by the strategies of Satan. He says, in addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flame and missiles of the evil one, okay? It's our faith that will be our protection, all right? Look also... Go to the right from Ephesians, past Colossians, past Timothy, 
past Philemon and go past Hebrews and go all the way to Peter. So I want you to look at First Peter. What we'll do, chapter four first. First Peter, chapter four. Past James, First Peter four. And let's look at verses twelve through fourteen. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Now think about it. Think about, just as an example in this country, what the, the kind of things that the left is talking about. You know, you can't reason with them. There are no facts that you can present to them. It's almost impossible, seemingly, to have any discussion with them. All right? But that's not the point. The point is that, that they are in the midst of doing something that may seem strange, but it's a spiritual test. Okay? It's a spiritual test. So don't try to figure it out or reason through it, or think that you can appeal to them, see that there's a spiritual reason behind it, and there's a spiritual force motivating it. We're going to get to that in a minute, too. Okay? Then go to 1 Peter 5, the next chapter. And I want to read verses 8 through 10. Be of sober spirit and be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Okay? Bottom line, he's always at work. He's always figuring out a new strategy, a new approach, manipulating inciting, you know, to get his strategy promoted in the world. He says, but resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. In other words, you're not alone in this. This is what's happening to the family of God, okay? The family of God, the true family of God. And then he, notice what he says in verse 10, which I think we should take comfort in. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. In other words, he's going to be behind your defense. Okay? You know, I think about, and we were mentioning it, Norman, before we started. You know, you look at what's going to be the beginning of Congress this year. And it's not hard to figure out what it's going to be. It's going to be constant, perpetual attacks against Trump, calling him every imaginable thing, accusing him every imaginable thing. Of course, they're already, as you said, they've already started filing, uh, you know, a motion for impeachment, okay? They're going to do everything in their power. It's going to be their single-minded focus to try to remove that man from office. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you agree or disagree with his policies, ask yourself this question, okay? When has this ever occurred? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. But there's a big difference here, okay? <laughs> He was guilty. Bill Clinton <laughs> clearly perjured himself. Not on the word if. <laughs> clearly perjured himself. Okay? And everybody in Congress knew that he perjured himself and that he was guilty. And that's why he was impeached. But look what the Senate did. They decided, and in view of everything, they weren't going to find him guilty even though the House impeached him, because it wasn't, in their opinion, 
an adequate reason to remove a president who had been elected by the public. And that's why I think they take, took the position. It isn't because they like the guy in terms of the Senate, okay? It's because they realize that impeaching a president is an extraordinarily serious thing. Extraordinarily serious. You know, think about it for a moment. If they do this, okay, what do you think the middle of America is going to do? You're going to talk about riots on the streets mm -hmm. like this country has probably never seen. Well, Tennessee and Kentucky and West Virginia will march on Washington. They will. And they'll come, then behind that will come some Texans and it'll look like Davy Crockett. Yeah, mm -hmm. You're right. It, it really it, will. It, it will create the they, second revolution in this country. It will scare the living hell out of the people. It will. Nancy Pelosi will wish the heck she never got married. Exactly. Nancy Pelosi better get herself in a bulletproof vehicle and live in it in bulletproof house from then on. Okay? I mean, I'm not saying that because I think it's a great idea. It will be a tragedy. Mm -hmm. It will be a tragedy. But if they promote this, it's going to create civil unrest and an absolute explosion in this country. Okay? Now, at any rate, I, I will try to not pontificate quite so much here. If, if, if Trump was smart, the first thing he'd do is shut the heck up. Mm -hmm. The second thing he needs to do is get the hell off of Twitter, Twitter mm -hmm. and no person in his administration has been able to tell him anything. Right. And that in itself can be his downfall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. But at the same time, I think the reason he does it is because he knows full well there isn't one media source out there that's going to accurately report anything he says. Uh, there's there's two, Newsmax and the OAN are now live and running. But the, the difficulty between what we're saying here tonight, I think, it just proves the patience of God. Because if you think back to what you're teaching and where we are today, even with Jesus coming here, God's still got an awful lot of patience for us. He does. Now, I want to show you something that I think is very important. We're already in 1 Peter 4. I want to show you verse 17, because it is a very enigmatic verse. I literally took this apart kind of word by word in the Greek. And it's, it's well, let's just read it first. But I think even in reading it in English, you'll see it's very, it seems very enigmatic. So let's read it. For this, is, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? I think, what, what's Peter telling? He's, he is talking about this in relationship to the end of days. That's the context here. Now, if you look at this verse, it's very interesting. The word judgment, you see right there, in the Greek means a last or final one. In other words, it's not one in a series of judgments, but it's the end type of judgment. It's the last in, in a series, the final one. That's what the Greek implies about this word. That's the tense it uses. And then it says, and if it begins with, the word begin is very interesting also. It means to be the first thing and to continue by something. Okay? It, it's, and it's a bizarre word because it's the word arco. The word arco or arche is the word that's used in Ephesians 6 to talk about the powerful demonic entities. So it seems to be indicating that this testing that's being talked about, this judgment time that's being talked about, is one that is perpetrated by the arche, which, and again, if you... We're only you're looking as an example in this country. There's plenty of other examples around the world. But if you look at the lunacy level of what's going on, 
how do you explain it any any other way? You know, it, it it's almost like looking in a way at at the last couple years before Hitler completely captivated the entire German population. You know, are we he, saying we're in 1933? I think that we're, there's a very great historical analogy here. You know, he would have these speeches that were so captivating mm -hmm. that people were literally mesmerized by him. Mm -hmm. And he That's would... That's what um, former Barack Obama, yeah. they were mesmerized yes. by him. Yes, absolutely. Okay. What does this verse from Peter really talk about? It's saying that there's going to be a time of judgment that means testing at, of and it's going to occur and be incited by satanic powers, okay? And it's going to occur first to those who are, quote, the household of God. In other words, the people who are being tested are not the world. The people that are being tested are the true church. That's what happened to Daniel. This is what happened to Daniel. But the testers will be inspired by a satanic world power. Well, okay? testing and temptation always comes from there. It does, but this is an unusual test because it says that this judgment is the last one in, in a line. The, well, because the, the, it says that Satan in the, the end of time will try to attract even the chosen one. He was, well, exactly, and, and he's doing a pretty good job of it. And then he uses this analogy, though, it's very interesting, the last word. He says, as tough as this testing may be, he says, um, he says, for what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? In other words, it's going to be a purifying test for the true church, but at least we are going to be led by the Holy Spirit and we're going to be, you know, covered by the grace of God. But what about those who are not? How will it affect them when this occurs in a far worse way? Uh, it's definitely darkness and they have no flashlight. Exactly. So exactly. The, they that's, that's a good way to put it. It says here that, that um, it is not saying about final judgment or... Mm -hmm. Because final judgment is the judgment it, near the white throne. Of all no, the it's not, no, it's not talking about the tribulation period. It's talking about something that occurs before it. Testing. Right. Specifically involving the true church. Because the word is judgment, therefore it's yeah. kind of that was my question. Yeah, and that's why the word judgment is means the last one in a row. But the focus is not against the world which is what the tribulation period. That's God's judgment against the world. That's not what he's talking about here in Peter. He's talking about a judgment testing against the church. He's going to purify what's left. That's the point. In other words, he's going <laughs> to, I'll put it this way, you know, think of it in athletic terms. He's going to get you ready for the title game. And it may be a really tough practice, but He's going to direct that practice, and he's going to get you ready. It's, it's, it, think again if you want to think locally. You, you look at what the practice was when you talk to players for the Michigan game this year. I mean, they got their you-know-whats kicked, you know, for the entire week to get them prepared to play the way they play. That's kind of the analogy of what's being said here. The question that I would have is, is that going to take place in the entire world? Or yes. It's going to take place yes. in the Yes, it's world. wherever the family of God is. Okay, how will we recognize it when it begins? Because you're going to see the events of persecutory behavior. Oh, it's happening in, in... You're going to see the falling away of the church from its true teaching, and you're going to see an increasing intolerance of the unbelieving world against the church. Okay, I think you're going to find that there's going to be a lot of 
illegal activities. I'm creating too much heat back here. For the okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, it, I think what you're going to find is like in Canada, it's going to come here. They're going to start making civil codes to say that the, that the traditional teachings of the church, you can't advocate. You can't say them out loud. I mean, literally, if you're a pastor in Canada at this point, your hands are absolutely tied. Absolutely tied because they monitor the pulpit so tightly because they're so pro-Islam, okay, that you can't, short of being jailed, and it's occurred. There have been pastors in Canada in the last several years that have been jailed for what we would call the normal teaching of the Scripture. It's not going to stay in Canada, okay? It's going to move around the world. All right. There's a lot of persecution in, in the parts of the world right. now. Mm -hmm. Our culture has been either whatever way you want to look at, fortunate or not so fortunate, depending on how you want to look at the nature of persecution, to avoid a lot of stuff like this. But what he's saying is there's going to be a day in which no one's going to avoid it as a Christian. It's going to be the whole family of God. That's what he's saying here in First Peter. So when you talk about judgment and falling away, does that mean some of that suffering will determine those that are really in Christ and those maybe that are just along for the ride? It's the wheat versus the chaff. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's the sifting. Mm -hmm. Who are the true ones? Uh, not just the ones that go on Sunday to a building. Who are the true ones? So anyway, let's move on because we, we still haven't quite gotten through this. But I think this is why I said I only took 11 verses because I think there's a lot in here. So the, the spiritual lesson of this chapter, as I said, is that we're to, you know, thrive and be lights in the world in a hostile world. Now, notice they first scrutinized Daniel's work in his government position. Surely they believe he must have cheated. He must have been on the dole. He must have lied. He must have stolen somewhere. There must be some skeletons in his closet. They could find none. That's unbelievable. It's remarkable. They just didn't dial up Bill Clinton. <laughs> That's true. Dial the right phone number, they'd have they would have had it, but this was not the person they were dealing with. So they developed a different tactic. Okay? As a Jew from his first days in Babylon, Daniel never attempted to hide his faith. Do you remember chapter 1? Yep. Right? The three young men, Daniel being one of them, they go to their their captain of the guard who's supervising their teaching and their eating and saying, look, we need in our faith to have a kosher diet. Let us eat our kosher diet, pray, follow Shabbat, okay, and then you judge us as to whether we excel or not. And, of course, they all excelled. Well, from the beginning, from the time they were 15, 16 years old, nothing had changed with this man, okay? He hadn't changed his behavior in this sense one bit. Don't you think I mean, if you're looking at where you are today in Daniel, wasn't the furnace for what took place a real calling for these people? I mean, if they're going to judge him, is the furnace still around? Well, of course, he wasn't part of that, he remember? Wasn't His buddies were. His buddies were. Yes. And that was under Nebuchadnezzar. And that was under Nebuchadnezzar. So this is a new regime, you know. And he's like 80. Five, Five, probably. Years old. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting. It says they came to an agreement. See it there? Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to Daniel here. They came to an agreement. Verse six. This is not a real good in English interpretation of what the word really means. The word is ragash in the Aramaic, and it means to have an uproar, to be excited as a group. Or I think the better phraseology would be to say a lynch mob. <laughs> That's really what they were doing. Uh, the, the gang created the, the plane. Exactly. Where we're we're going to get him. That's the uproar. Okay. okay. We can be in charge. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the, the way they decided to do this was by stroking Dar Darius's ego as they offer him what I am calling here the God of the Month plan. <laughs> so that's literally what they did. No one for a month can pray to anyone but to you. And if they pray to anyone but you for the next 30 days, then they shall be thrown into a lion's den with hungry lions, and that shall be their end. So they manipulate his pride, and they end up getting a legal code signed by him. And, of course, we're going to look at this in a second. Legal codes, especially in the Median world and how they did their law, could not be – there was no uh, uh, repeal. You couldn't repeal them. They and sign them. That's it. Or legal code means like the law. Yeah. Absolutely. It was. Well, a, doesn't it say where the king couldn't even. Nope. He yeah. couldn't do it. He now, could make it, but he couldn't. Let, let me give you an example yeah. of this. Yeah. Turn. Keep keep your hand in Daniel, but turn to the book of Esther. So you're going to go back to your left, past the prophets, past Psalms, and just just you go to Job and the next. One to the left is Esther. Before Job. Just before Job. Go to chapter 1. This is now Esther lives in a different time in the Medea Persian Empire. Later. Okay, under another king called Xerxes. Okay? She okay, but here's what it says. And we're going to look at verse 19. Now there's this uproar that's occurred. Xerxes has a queen called uh, Vashti, okay? Apparently what happens is, if you, and I'm not going to go, I'm not going to have you read all of it, but they're having this huge party, br drunken brawl. The implication in the language is that the king, in his drunken stupor, orders Vashti to come in, okay? And the implication in the, in, actually in the language is to do something lewd before the crowd. Mm -hmm. That's really the implication mm -hmm. in, the, in the language. Did it actually call it friends? <laughs> apparently. <laughs> they apparently were friends. Okay? <laughs> so she refuses to come in. Okay? So, here's the, here, so the, all the princes that are at this party are furious. She is not coming in to do this. Of course, they're drunk out of their minds. So read verse 19. So they say to, to Xerxes, if it pleases the king, let a royal edict be issued by him, and let it be written in the laws of, the Persia, of Persia and Medea, so that it cannot be repealed, that Vashti should come no more into the presence of the king. His Xerxes' other name was uh, Osiris and let the king give her royal position to another who is more worthy than she. In other words, they make this code, and she's persona non grata. Mm -hmm. Okay? There is no hope of overcoming this code. It's done. It's over. Okay? This was the nature of the Medea Persian code system, the codex system. So this is what they do in regards to Daniel. Now, here's the truly amazing point of this part of the chapter, and I find this to be incredible. I mean, I, I think about this, and I think, what a man. I mean, it just amazes me. Mm -hmm. Here's the spiritual point. He wasn't consulted about this, even though he's supposedly the head of all of them, mm -hmm. okay? He heard about the plot, it says in the verses. He knew what they did. He heard about the law they made and knows about the penalty with the law. He knows all of it, it says. Did you, did you see it? Daniel there? Okay. So what does he do? He goes home. He goes up to his roof, opens the lattice of his prayer room, turns to the west towards Jerusalem, and begins to pray, knowing full well what? That this 
Probably well, could be the long day of his life. That, that he's got uncountable spies around him watching him while he's doing this. He knows exactly what's going to happen, precisely. Okay? But he decides that it's more important to do the will of God than it is to follow this law. And that's why he does what he does. He could have gone to a secret inner room. He could have pulled the blinds. He could have prayed there. But he does exactly what his opponents want him to do. Now, it makes a point. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. I want to show you a couple examples of people that were exactly in this situation. Acts chapter 5. Now, this is where they begin a persecution in Jerusalem, okay, against the church. The church is beginning to grow rapidly. Remember, all at once Peter preaches and 3,000 are saved. You know, the church becomes to expand exponentially, all right? It starts in Jerusalem, it moves north. You know where the next place it moved was, interestingly? The next major place the church went was Antioch. Well, in, in Europe. Well, no, well, it, went, it went to Syria. Okay. It went north up into Syria. And there's a, that's why there's such a tr tremendous tradition of Christianity historically in Syria, even though Islam has persecuted it into virtual non-existence mm -hmm. now. But that was where it went. At any rate, look at verse 29. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees get a hold of Peter, okay? They beat him up, all right? They whip him, they, you know, and, and they say in verse 29, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, the name, Jesus, okay? <laughs> Behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood, that is Christ's, upon us. In other words, the byline is the Romans are putting great pressure on us. We're going to get in the deepest imaginable trouble if you keep doing this. That's what they're saying to Peter. Look what he says to them. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross, and he is the one whom God has exalted in his sight and, 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 and his, to the right hand as prince and savior, to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. In other words, we don't care what you do, we ain't going to shut up. That's what Peter and the apostles said. Um, turn to 1 Corinthians 10 from Acts. Turn over to your right past Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's Paul speaking. I'm sorry. I said 1 Corinthians 10, and I just turned to 2 Corinthians. So you got to go back to 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overcome you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also that you may be able to endure it. In other words, with the same promise that there's going to be trouble, God endorses that he will be right there in the midst of the trouble with you. Whatever you go through, you will not be alone. You will not be alone. You know, there were some miraculous things that happened to the apostles. Okay? They did some miraculous things. Many miracles occurred. We have many promises. We do. Jesus said that trouble Yes, absolutely. So we have to keep that in mind. 
So, matter of fact, there's a quote from a, a British theologian who I've read a few of his books. His name is Martin Lloyd Jones. It's really quite good. Matter of fact, I have his, I have his writing on, uh, on the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. It's really excellent. Lloyd Jones says this: Man is at his highest and greatest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. Mm-hmm. We are called to pray constantly, unceasingly, perpetually, daily, all the time, because it's our link to our Lord. So it's interesting that, oh, by the way, I I missed this. Norman, you'll like this. I, I, I didn't, talking about this issue about character, there's a famous quote by Horace Greeley. Does anyone know who Horace Greeley was? Okay. He, he, lived, he lived between 1811 and 1872. He was an author, statesman, and he was the founder of the New York Tribune, which was the most successful and largest newspaper probably of its day in, in the United States. Okay. And Horace Greeley sta- made this statement, quote, fame is a vapor popularity in accident, riches take to the wings, those who cheer today will curse you tomorrow, and the only thing that endures is character. <laughs> that's what Horace Greeley said. Well, that's the one thing that they're going to hammer Trump on, the last word, character. That's, that's the thing, and, and if you look at the elections in November, uh, those who voted against him were white women based on a character issue. Yeah. That Storm, Storm Daniels and other ladies were yeah. just they, too bright. They, not, no, that's true, but well, I don't want to get into that right now. But, but bottom line, as we go and finish the chapter next week, his opponents report him immediately. They believe they have successfully trapped their opponent. The trap has been sprung on him, and they have succeeded. But they could not possibly anticipate the surprise that was soon to come. And that's what we'll see in the last half of the chapter. That's what they thought they did to Jesus. Absolutely. He's gone. Yay. Got rid of him. Surprise. So, at any rate, next week we will finish up chapter 6.